Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is P. Steph. I am here talking with my friend Johanna. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about their new project. I am in London, they're in Berlin. You are here at the ICA. Johanna, what, what are we talking about? Um, hi, everyone. I just realized I have to change my screen to something else. Um, thank you all for joining us asynchronously in this disassociated void universe. Um, we're <laughs> recording this before you'll see it. Um, and the astrology has just been a nightmare to try to make that happen. But anyway, I'm in Berlin and we're gonna talk about this um, kind of kooky new project that I spent the year making called Glut, a super abundance of nothing. Um, at the moment, the immersive sound installation of it is up at the Hakave in Berlin as part of a group exhibition called Illiberal Arts that you can see until November 21st. Um, but there's also a video game version that is up indefinitely that you can download for free at the website glut.website. And it's a kind of complicated, bizarre um, project with lots of different pieces. So I guess we'll just try to explain them in an interesting fashion. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna grill you about it. I was so happy when you asked if I would do this with you. I obviously always love talking to you, but I, to anyone that knows me well, um, I'm like a full-blown gamer girl, non-stop uh, lifer. Um, and so I was like, oh, great. I get to talk about video games with Johanna. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, this is also why I thought it, I mean, we're friends and I feel like you've kind of watched a lot of these um, things I've been thinking about over the last few years come into some sort of form. But I also knew that you were a gamer girl, so I thought <laughs> it would be really fun to talk to you about it. So, okay, I played through Glut. Um, I was, I felt like I was immediately picking up on a bunch of video game references um, and so that's kind of where I wanted to start with you. Like it reminded me of Dark Souls or Bloodborne, certain enemies from Half-Life. Um, I know when we talked the other day, you mentioned Hideo Kojima, which was exciting. Um, but it also reminded me of games like, like uh, Stanley Parable or sort of indie, indie video games that have come out recently. So yeah, I kind of wanted to be like, Johanna, are you a gamer? <laughs> I don't think that I have the experience and the, like, I feel very much like a noob in gamer lands. So I don't think I can identify as one. However, um, the earliest experience with games that I remember having was playing Myst with my dad in the 90s, like on CD-ROMs, and we would just stare into this, like, world it took us forever to get through that fucking tunnel like the subway tunnel um and there have been games over the years that have like really changed my life um but i don't like regularly play them i'm not part of like an active gamer um niche community either mm -hmm. um and i did take a course in the this is funny. When I was at UCLA, I had to take a coding class and it was based around interactivity. And one of our big projects was we had to make a game. And my game was two static copepods, illustrations of copepods. Copepods are a parasite that live on the anuses of salmon. And the game was just that they would enact waiting for Godot as you like, <laughs> moved your mouse over them and I remember being dragged for filth by my fucking professor who's now just a dear friend but he was like playing it and he was like yeah but do you know that games are supposed to be fun <laughs> so I feel like that's sort of um a good example of my approach to games is I don't think they can like they only need to be fun and the ones that I really, yeah, the ones that I really like are, are usually the ones that, 
like our like mist wasn't really that much of a game in a classical sense and the big reference that i kept going back to over and over again for glut was pt mm -hmm. which is a game but is also not even a proper game it's a promotional trailer that's what pt stands for mm -hmm. and the kind of general experience of being in that hallway is something i mean it's like yeah, you can kind of figure things out in it, but it's also something else. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. thinking about games in this other way, I guess. Yeah, I, I, it sort of made sense to me immediately when I started playing it that you would move into that sphere. And I wonder um, if you can talk about that process, like for anyone that hasn't played it or doesn't know it. Um, yeah, you are this tumor dragging yourself through a sort of never ending tunnel um, that morphs and shifts. Um, you're being either followed or leaving a trail of purple flowers. Although um, quite early on, I was like, those purple flowers aren't good. I got to get away from those. And then I eventually realized I was making the purple flowers. <laughs> um, and, and, then, and then text is kind of moving, moving with you through you. Um, and then there's, I mean, this really intense sound like, give me the give me the the rundown with it yeah so the sound i guess is the core um that is the connecting um bit that holds the video game and the sound installation together so the sound installation at the hakave is this immersive um very small dark claustrophobic room with a you know kind of spatialized sound um of the of the sound piece that's then in the video game. Um, so so I have this kind of kooky origin story for the whole thing, which is that many years ago um, in LA, I went to a witch. And how I got there and why I was there is kind of like also a weird long story, but whatever. But when I was there, she was like, I think what we should do is find your inner temple so you can find your sacred weapons. And I was like, all right. So we did this like shamanic trance where she's like guiding me through this thing. And she's like, you'll be empowered when you finally get there. You'll know it when you see it. And when I got there, it was like this horrifying kind of ocean, black ocean in a cave that was really, you know, nowhere to sit down. I mean, very uncomfortable. And then she was like, look in the altar in this, you know, sacred temple and take up your weapons. And it was just a bunch of like, kind of horrifying body horror bits, like, like brain and a rope of bowel and this kind of thing. So I just started to laugh. I thought it was really funny. And then I just didn't think about it much anymore about like instigating any kind of project. And then recently, I had this very uncanny experience where Amazon recommended my own book to me. And for whatever reason, I like flashed on this, you know, like cave with these bits of a body as this kind of like spiritual experience that I don't know, like I started to think like that I wanted to make this in a real way, like produce this feeling of kind of a spiritual uncanniness or like an anti-transcendence. And the Amazon thing, I think, triggered it because there's something kind of quite impressive and seemingly magical about how well Amazon's algorithm can figure you out. Like I was kind of impressed that of all of the bazillions of consumer products it could recommend to me pretty quickly it figured out to recommend my own book which is also like on a very tiny press and very niche and slow print run like kind of a weird subject so I kind of was like it felt a little bit like a version of a mysticism um, that had a lot of confusion and dread and doom in it and that it just generally is how mystical experiences feel to me Mm -hmm. And I feel like in digital space or virtual space, that feeling gets really amplified. Mm -hmm. um, so the sound installation at the Hakave is like a physical thing was going to be happening. Um, but it was really, you know, early on quickly apparent that having an immersive, tiny, ventless, lightless room was not going to be accessible for some people. 
um, certainly in a pandemic, but also just anyone with claustrophobia, you know, lots of reasons why people couldn't see it. So we started to think about um, ways to make it accessible. And I won this award um, from Shape Arts. That's an organization in the UK that um, annually gives an award to a disabled artist. And they basically just support that artist to make something. Um, and in my case, they were like, well, why don't we help you make an accessible version of this, whatever that would look like. And they were like, by the way, we're really like close with this firm that makes video games and VR and AR experiences. Like maybe that would be good. And I didn't know, like, I didn't know if that was the right idea, but mm -hmm. we met. I met with um, Andrew um, at Hot Knife, this, the firm. And instantly we had all of these like kind of overlapping references. We were talking about horror movies, games like the ones you mentioned. Um, and then we were kind of like, maybe we could make a video game. What would that even look like? And so then I spent 2021 every Monday meeting Andrew and just cooking up a bunch of crazy shit, like, like those purple spores that grow out of where you've been. At one point we were like, well, it's sort of disorienting in there. How can we give people like a wayfinding device that's also a bit menacing. Originally, we tried having like different fluid, like bodily fluid stains, but then it quickly became too like saw serial killer basement. <laughs> so we're like, mm, not that. Let's try mushrooms. Like, you know, like just these different kind of like aesthetic, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know, choices within the game. I had a blast making it. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I mean, considering what a, um, a hardcore hobby it is of mine, I, I, don't tend to incorporate that much stuff, I don't think, in my work from the amount of video games that I play. But there is something um, I love about things like, okay, how do you build in a wayfinding device? We know, let's, you leave this trail of mushrooms. There is a sort of um, really beautiful confluence of like user design and accessibility with imagination um, that, that, that kind of creates a very different way of navigating space, um, of understanding how a body moves through a space or, or something like that, you know? Um, yeah. I had a, a couple of questions which were, and I don't know if these are connected. Um, the first one is that I don't know what non-Euclidean means. All right. <laughs> and the second one is, and it's maybe it's connected, is that I was sort of interested that you talk about them all as being like internal spaces, um, as like you're traveling, I don't think you said this, but traveling down like an intestine into a cave. Um, and I sort of wonder if if those are the insides, what are, what are the outside spaces? Are the outside spaces um, real world, meat space, like as people like to say? Um, or is, is there a different type of outside in that digital realm? They are outside spaces, actually. Like, I guess that was one of the, um, I guess, like, one of the questions or these sort of rhetorical, like, almost provocations that the project presents is something around, like, well, where, ex like, how exactly is an inside different from an outside? Um, how exactly is an alien space different from some internal familiar space? Mm -hmm. um, the non-Euclidean thing is actually a cheat because in Unity, the software we built the game and you can't do non-Euclidean geometry. Basically, Euclidean geometry named after Euclid um, is planar, meaning that it's a, I mean, the shorthand is it's just sort of a geometry that exists on a plane. Mm -hmm. So anything that's not that, like a sphere or a hyperbolic space or an elliptical space would be considered non-Euclidean. And so when you're building in game space, it is planar. Mm -hmm. So we kind of thought of different ways to cheat that non-Euclidean, because there are some video game softwares, I guess you can do this. Um, but like an example of a, like a non-Euclidean thing in a game would be if you're approaching a house or a structure that looks like this, and then you go into it and suddenly it's the shape of a dome inside. 
Mm -hmm. or if you're going into a hallway that looks like this long and then when you're in it it becomes this long it's just kind of like a surreal disorienting you know um, representation of space so there's one part of the game that's that where we'd really tried to do this where this is also i'm spoilers or i'm giving away <laughs> What's the equivalent of like a spoiler in a video game for like how you figure something out? Spoilers? Just a spoiler. Okay, so spoilers. <laughs> but maybe this is useful for some people because I've heard that they've gotten stuck. Mm -hmm. so when you go through this spike tunnel and then you come to the kind of end of, a, end of this room and it says turn around and go back and find the portal, you just turn around and go back through the tunnel and you'll see that suddenly it's like it's shifted in size and scale from what you just came through. Um, so there were just like little things like this where we wanted to like really disorient, like are you a microscopic tumor in a intestine or are you like an alien body on the surface of a moon? Mm -hmm. Like these things I think were kind of like we were trying to kind of build different worlds and experiences that would make that feel. Yeah, it reminded me of certain games like maybe Limbo or something where your 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 purpose is often sort of held withheld from you. You know, I, I, I found myself wondering, uh, yeah, what was I doing? What was my purpose there? Am I am I am I filling a, a, a an animal or a person or whatever's body with spores? Am I there to latch onto a larger organ um, or something, something like that? You know? Yeah, I feel like if we had more money um, and time, there would have been a bit more like puzzle kind of solving interactivity going on in the game. Because as of as of now, it was really built to kind of conjure some sort of representation and experience that would that would be a way to embody the sound digitally. So the sound piece, I should say, um, this like thing that holds all the pieces together, um, came out of this, I really wanted to make something with AI, particularly with vocal clone softwares um, from a critical, perspective. I'm really, I'm really interested in the idea that AI has existed for a long, long time before computers in, in the form of divination techniques. So if you understand an intelligence to do something like predict uh, something based on a pattern, understand a pattern, you know, be able to kind of articulate meaning out of a set of data points. This is what divination does all the time. Um, However, very quickly, when I started to like look into vocal clone softwares, I realized that all of them, if you're buying a proprietary one in the terms and conditions, they say they can sell your voice data to the government mm -hmm. um, or corporations. So um, I worked with Jessica Kosrick, who's this genius um, alien uh, musician, artist, technologist, writer. And we basically built we trained two AI vocal clones based on my voice that are not my actual voice. So my voice data wasn't used. We manipulated and vocoded my voice when we were training these things. Um, and one of the things when you're training vocal clones is you have to give it something to say. Mm -hmm. So, and in AI world, this is called a corpus, which I just love. Um, <laughs> So we, I built this text corpus um, that's hundreds of lines long. We ended up only using, I think, 20 or 22 or something in the final thing. But um, I just took a lot of sentences from different sources that felt like they got at this mystical and canny thing that I was talking about. So there's like physicists talking about dark matter, mathematicians talking about nothingness, mystics from the apophatic tradition who are saying God is not, 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 not. Um, and then things that the Amazon algorithm says. Mm -hmm. So we kind of train these two clones. One is called Arid and one is called Mud um, to speak this corpus. And then the only kind of sonic uh, accompaniment to them is just me screaming and Jessica Kazrick 
uh, produce the sound and put it together. So it's like I would just stand in this room. Like there's a retching sound that happens when the avatar is at rest. Mm -hmm. So there's like some that exists in the Dropbox, some 15 minute clip of me standing in here being like, bleh, bleh, bleh. <laughs> like, like trying it out, different ones, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it was just, yeah, like the idea was to kind of build this whole cacophony of different voices. Um, mm -hmm. Even the bits and the sound that's, that don't sound like a voice are, um, are all my voice. Mm, amazing. I am... Um... Something I mentioned to you a while ago was uh, your sort of like South Node Sag theorizing about Amazon. Crackpot theories, <laughs> crackpot theories. <laughs> Amazon is divination. Um, reminded me of something my friend Chiara Giovando said to me once, which was that she really thought that, or thinks that um, our you know, collective obsession with the internet for those people who use it um, is that it is that it taps into a sort of latent psychic connective tissue between us all um, that that you know as a social body as humans however you want to understand it um, there is a desire to connect on a level that is that is divinatory psychic transcendental in some way um, and that you know the internet essentially was like a fast track and a very janky problematic, difficult, fast track to something that is integral. And um, it's, it's sort of your thoughts about Amazon and the algorithm as divination sort of reminded me of that. But I wonder, did, did training the vocal um, bots change your feelings about algorithmic divination? Are they even connected for you? Like they, they sort of feel like similar impulses to me. Yeah, no, I mean, one of the big, I think, things that anyone with any sort of poetic uh, mind or even just a sense of humor when you're working with AI, I mean, it's so, you know, the limitations of, of it are so hilarious. Um, I think this is also true if you code. Um, like, like, like you very quickly understand how stupid the computer is and coding is trying to translate basically like human instructions into a language that the computer can understand. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's such like, like code just in the majority of programming languages are so not intuitive. They're, they're really far away from, from the way human languages can feel. Although there are plenty of different, very abstract human languages. Um, but yeah, I mean, when we would be training it, I mean, one of the things that was really just, you know, we just, I don't even know what the word is. When you're using these things, it gives you um, a script to read to do the first training. And it's the screenplay of Planet Earth 2. And so you have to read it so that the thing can kind of like have a baseline of data. But, you know, you're reading stuff that's like, contrary to popular belief, Africa is not only a wasteland. Like, <laughs> like, like and this is, I guess the thing is like politics, ethics, the world, the lived material conditions of, you know, life are embedded in, any of our digital tools. Mm -hmm. um, and so this was like one of the, the issues that Jessica and I were always trying to get around is to like being able, you know, be able to use one of these things or train one of these things and yet not participate in like all of the fucking surveillance that's embedded in everything on the internet. Yeah. I mean, and I think when I say this thing that like Amazon is a new form of mysticism, I'm kind of being, you know, like, like a part of me is this a bit south node and sag like just throwing out some provocation that's maybe not real but just to like say something a little bit scandalous mm -hmm. um because i think one of the things i feel about mysticism and witchcraft and divination is that people especially now tend to just hold these things in a certain awe mm -hmm. like oh they're just so magical and powerful but they're tools and languages like any of these other things. And so, of course, they can be bent to the nefarious needs of a particular, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, zeitgeist, 
whatever. And I so, think something, it's just quickly something I've always um, appreciated about like our conversations around astrology and things like that is kind of connected to a conversation that does seem to be happening more, at least I see within astrological communities and particularly um, with like post-colonial astrology that Alice Sparkly Cat wrote, like really in, in, in your work as a mystic um, and gradually happening more broadly is like a, an awareness and a critique of uh, what, do we, what do we mean when we say at home or exiled or yeah. uh, why, is, why is fortune associated with the same house as children? Um, yeah. and, and, and what is baked into that? And that's what I get out of this suggestion that, um, you know, the Amazon algorithm is divination. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just get so pissed about, I'll try to keep this short. I mean, I mean, this like kind of current moment of astrology being used is basically like a kind of neoliberal self-actualization thing. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I'm just trying to be my true self. It's like, to me, what is so great about astrology is how robust it is as a language to talk about difficulty and suffering. <laughs> like, and also, I mean, that's just sort of my own personal vibe. But like the other thing that's great about it is that, you know, for centuries, I mean, even millennia, that image of your birth chart was not an image of your own psyche which is what it became and has become with the invention of the psychological self. It's like now people look at their chart and they're like, oh, see, I'm, I'm so funny or whatever. But for the majority of this as a craft, that was an image of like the world, the cosmos, and you're just like one tiny piece in this thing that's like multiple scales of forces, political, economic. And so of course they have these structural Mm -hmm. values like you know built into them so yeah yeah I get kind of cranky about that so part of this was I think playing around with this idea of like the internet being a utopia which of course nobody believes anymore but I think that this new kind of era of social media Amazon you know the algorithm um I'm, I'm just really curious about how that is going to end up feeling and how it kind of changes what we believe in as what can be transcendent, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, my, 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 my last little bit of video game thought is that, um, you know, in a way, like I, I see some of this stuff being tackled most robustly in certain video games. So like Kojima's Metal Gear Solid series was talking about com things that we talk about culturally um, for a long time, you know, it's, it's, uh, this is probably obvious to anyone tuning into the talk, but video games can naturally feel like this devalued, uh, um, what genre or technology or, or, or whatever, um, when in fact, you know, anyone who, who is like invested in gaming, <laughs> <laughs> which even feels silly to say but you know to, to really involve yourself with it as an art form you can often see really prescient conversations happening um or or yeah difficult difficult things that go beyond just like fun frivolous uh game playing you know i'm gonna try out a crackpot armchair theory that might not take just as like i'm listening to you say this i wonder if it's because of the interactivity i think generally in art if it's interactive, mm -hmm. there's this kind of like, there's a devaluing around this idea that like a, like a real art experience would just sort of almost like going back to like a sublime, mm -hmm. it would just be this awesome thing. And you're like, a just go uh, in front of it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, just forms like performance, even like, I mean, even though relational aesthetics was so at some point supported by the institution, like, there are still like certain forms like this that are not considered like real art by a certain normative establishment. And I'm just wondering, like, maybe I'll regret that I'm wondering about this out loud in this public way, but I wonder if it's like an interaction thing that there's something that kind of like, if you're on some kind of plane of existence one-to-one -one with the thing and you can even, you know, change it based on what you do to it as the viewer or user. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
like this is very like not how traditional art is supposed to be you know yeah absolutely i think both of us work in spheres that uh to give concession to a body is to devalue the um yeah the, the thing that you're producing yeah um and i kind of like thank thank god that in our expanded community there is a push away from that or a push against it you know um yeah because you know video games are not inherently accessible but for me what you're saying touches into this same realm of um of, of devaluing through accessibility essentially and interaction um yeah. you know this is exactly right i mean i mean this was also the thing that i felt like i was really like laboring all year to say when I would talk about this project is that the video game is not like the supplement to the installation at the Hakave. Like the real way to experience the sound piece is not the corporal IRL thing in the museum. Mm -hmm. Like the free game on the internet that you can download and then accessibility in terms of the video game just quickly like shape um you know produced and funded video like playthroughs with as um, american sign language and british sign language we did an audio description of the whole thing um and you know i really had to kind of like fight for an accessibility statement to be included at the hakave not at the top but within some parts of the administration team because you know, I think like one of the ideas about accessibility from a disabled person's perspective is that you want access that will just say how the thing is and is not accessible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But from the institution's perspective, that's trying to make itself look good. And this is true for like any institution I've ever worked with. They just want to say how it is accessible. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I really wanted to have be you know very clearly stated for my piece was that it's not wheelchair accessible it's not okay for some people because of covid like i mean it's only for one person at a time and the door does get opened after each person goes in but still there are plenty of people for whom that would still be too risky to do mm -hmm. and i wanted to like list all of this stuff there not as like a massive content warning, but just as a way to be like, we're just being honest about what this is and is not. And mm -hmm. if you can't access, access this, you can also just go download this game for free. Mm -hmm. And there are these different ways that it can be accessible to you that way. I don't know, I think about this a lot with accessibility, like, you know, even the idea that so many museums still don't have benches. I'm like, <laughs> I just don't get it. I'm like, you don't even need to like be, I don't know what a bench is usually thought of to be needed by a certain kind of person. Like I want a bench just mm -hmm. so I can sit there and spend more time with the thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I'm going to start ranting about accessibility stuff. <laughs> well, I mean, I do want to sort of um, ask how you understand Glut as a project fitting into fitting into a wider body of work, um, because I think people that are familiar with your work will see things from Minerva, things from the record percolating in there, and I mean that both aesthetically um, or with a set of concerns, but also um, maybe what is inherently political in the work that you're making. Does that feel accurate? Yes, I mean, I kind of wish that I had a really great response. I mean, I don't think I do. I think that I'm kind of like, the way I kind of understand these projects is like they seem, I think on the surface to be very different because they're in such different forms or genres or media, like there's, a doom metal album and a video game and an installation in a museum and whatever. But to me, they're all kind of a, a little like bundle of ideas 
that I'm just trying out in these different forms. And I think what the form does to those ideas is really just very interesting to me on a like, in a practical level, like I could just think about it for a while and that's what's exciting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like I got asked recently and I was, I had a similar kind of problem with coming up with a good answer. Um, somebody asked me like, how do you decide to like write a poem versus pick up the guitar versus make a video game versus this? And I was saying that like, I don't think I have an answer that's gonna satisfy what's interesting about that question because what's interesting about that question is exactly what I'm thinking about too. Mm -hmm. Where it's like, yeah, like what would happen you know, to an idea about the confusion and dread and body horror of like the mystical uncanny if it happened in a video game that you could play on your computer and kind of have like a you know this kind of virtual experience of going through this like 3d digital space mm -hmm. versus sitting in a little room we've been joking at the hakave that my piece is like the toilet to hell because it's like this little <laughs> see i just want to say for anyone going to see it I think it's funny. Like when I sit in in the glut installation and like the subwoofer is like growling through your ass about the void, like I'm like cracking up in there. So I think it's like supposed to be funny. Um, <laughs> also like after I like showed it to Anselm and Kesht and the curators, like when it was all done, we like came out into the light and Anselm was like, adorable <laughs> it's like exactly <laughs> um yeah i don't know i guess it's i don't know if that's like that's more of an answer to the aesthetic part of your question i mean politically i think that access in this way is also like like i i noticed that when you talk about access with people like it's often sort of tacked on at the end of a thing as this kind of inconvenient chore that you have to think about now mm -hmm. and i and i think that it's like much more generative and fun if you put it at the beginning and just think about it in terms of like how there can be different ways to enter the work mm -hmm. and that's political but it's also just like you know it's interesting to me to think about like different ways that I've come to a work because at some point in my life I realized that the majority of the pieces that I think are like amazing that have really changed me I wasn't necessarily like in the primary audience for them either they happened before I was born or I heard about it through a friend or like I heard a myth or a rumor or something you know what I mean like there are these kinds of ways that these things like circulate and exist and have different lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, too long didn't read. It's just a form of drag. And I mm -hmm. think it's, you know, a way of like dressing something up mm -hmm. and seeing mm -hmm. what happened, you know, like what would she wear to the funeral of her third husband? Like, you know, is a certain kind of <laughs> way of understanding that character. Yeah, versus, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think also, um, both of us have a similar interest in something that you described as um, the way that astrology can be used as a as a as a tool to describe the quality of things. Um, uh, the way that certain certain things can touch and move and have a um, a quality that is like contingent, I suppose. And I feel like often in your work, and similarly in Glut, there's a there's a desire, there's like that same impulse is there to understand, um, I can't think of a better word than, than the quality of something. Um, yeah, yeah. Is that a, yeah, that's not really a question. But no, but no, this was um, something that I was thinking about a lot this year when time became like just this like, you know, discombobulating bath of like gravity, but also nothing is like where I feel like I aged a hundred years overnight. And then, you know, I don't know, time just started to feel very, um, like lacking a quality during the pandemic. And one of the things I like that kind of grounded me a bit in that was thinking about like how astrology, I think in terms of 
like another thing that it's so good at is thinking about the quality of like, how is night different from day? How is September different from October? How is this year different from last year? And, and, you know, this to me is also a very political thing because like, you know, when you start to have these more like, like astrology and stuff, but more like earth-based belief systems where the world is enchanted, once those start to get systematically like delegitimated mm -hmm. as being valid knowledge, it's happening at the same time that capitalism is taking root and there's a kind of colonial regime that starts to just extract mm -hmm. materials from the earth, you know, without any kind of boundary. And that like the way that time exists under these regimes of capitalism and colonialism is only quantity. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have a quality. It doesn't have a quality that's like, now you produce, now you rest. Now you're, you bloom as a flower and now you regenerate or whatever, like these kinds of cycles go away when you only have time measured as a quantity, mm -hmm. like eight hours a day, 40 hours a week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I just was really like, I, I have also noticed that since I've lived in Berlin, like the Zodiac calendar makes more sense to me as a way of just understanding like the seasons you know i'm from la they don't exist so like coming finally to like a place where like capricorn and aquarius season fucking suck in the winter <laughs> like <laughs> they're harsh like like you get very grim you have to like ration your energy you have to think about the future like these are like capricornian mm -hmm. qualities mm -hmm. in terms of like managing resources on a material level because it's so miserably cold mm -hmm. and dark out. Mm -hmm. And in the Northern hemisphere, at least, and like, you know, the difference between that and like Taurus season, where everything is just like lush and beautiful and like we survived and like, let's just sit outside and the colors. It's okay like, to be dumb. <laughs> yeah, like it's okay to just like want to eat food. Like, <laughs> yeah. I think about that a lot. <laughs> like, like once I moved to a place with seasons, like I, I really understood certain signs, like <laughs> in a deep way. <laughs> um, I feel like that's probably our time limit. I think. Can um, I ask you a question? Yeah. I wanted to ask you because you had sent me your notes before, and you mentioned this thing of how we both, I think, are thinking about worlds that are co-present um mm -hmm. not necessarily being like elsewhere but here simultaneously i mean i really think about that with your with your show on venus mm -hmm. um which when i was in it i was so like i had a similar kind of immersive uh disorienting experience mm -hmm. i just wanted to ask you about these about these new things you're making and like if that's continuing that i mean i didn't get to see the new thing you just made yeah yeah uh, for freeze but i've seen your holographic poems which i think are so yeah beautiful because they're so ephemeral and stuff i don't know Can you just yeah i well i think so so to give some context here, I sent Johanna a, a bunch of my notes of what I thought I might ask them. Um, and in there was, was this kind of rambling um, thing, not really a question. But I, I, I do think that there is a, a shared impulse in our work and, and everything you've been talking about today touches on it like this sort of interest in describing um, parallel worlds, kind of co-presences co of, of, of like realities and ways of being, um, but they're not, they're not elsewhere. They're somehow with us all the time. Um, I think queerness and transness and cryptness can, can fuel, fuel those interests, you know what I mean? And probably both of our desires to articulate those registers maybe come from those experiences or, or, or like feelings in our lives. Um, but what was interesting, I thought, was that, you know, in all of this work I've been making about Venus and this idea of being on Venus, which for me is really about using a planet as a sort of 
cosmological sibling space to the one that we inhabit now. Venus is Earth, Earth is Venus. Mm -hmm. um, but then I have sort of used it to articulate what I think of as a kind of aesthetics of dysphoria, um, yeah. a sort of a sort of a, a grief to take it back to its like original linguistic meaning, like a sort of grief of being. Um, but I was interested for you in, in Glut, and I wonder probably the same in, in a lot of Minerva and the record too, that this seems, the one that, the, the co-presence, the thing we're living with that you're talking about feels like gut, gut-like. It's, it's mm. like, it's coming in and down. Um, I suppose I felt like maybe my, my version of that was like this, be this beaming is beaming outwards to a to another planet that's actually very much our own. Um, another type of violence happening elsewhere that's actually just happening here. Um, it feels like, yeah, for you, it's 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 deep down in the guts, you know. Does that feel well, I, I feel like yours is like a cosmological light, mm -hmm. like not in a love and light way, but like in this idea that like light can travel through space. And that's actually how we can measure time. Like there's something like there was so, like, I mean, I, I wrote this piece about on Venus where I was just talking about the color yellow and that quality of light that was in that show. And then these holographic poems like are doing something with light also. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah. Um, so I feel like you wouldn't be an ap apophatic mystic, <laughs> which are the ones that are just the negation kind. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that mine, I just, my gut, you know, bowel thing is just because I have everything in Taurus and Scorpio. It's very like mouth to anus with me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> I don't have this like, you know, the stratosphere of the Aquarius Pisces kind of part. Yeah, of yeah. Thing. Similarly to your, I, I think I mentioned this in an email to, your one, to you once, but similarly to your AI thing, I feel like anytime I write a poem, I end up just writing nothing, nothing, no, nothing. <laughs> it, it's gone. There's a, there's a totality and it's gone. Yeah. And that's yeah. what you're describing. Yeah. Yeah. There's, you know, I, I took my first writing class of my life this year with Janice Lee, who is teaching um, an online class on the Korean concept of Han and how to use it in writing. And um, one of the things that I did for that class, it wasn't like really an assignment, but one of the things I did was like try to write down my like top five or 10 like topics which is an interesting exercise to just try to do. Like, what are my subjects? Mm -hmm. And it was just like nothingness, the void, you know, annihilation. Mm -hmm. doom. Sleep is a war zone, doom. Like just this very, and I was like, oh, um, because like, <laughs> it was like one of those moments like where you're in a therapist's office and you're like, you realize that you're a rage monster and you're like, oh, I didn't realize like, <laughs> I don't know like yeah like I'm like trying to think about it like how did this happen like why am I so goth I don't know right right I have no answer yeah I no I relate I'm like I think I'm like the anorexic mystic that's just sort of seeking seeking to be a beam of light that yeah eventually fades away in this in space you know yeah definitely <laughs> pastel in pastels maybe Okay, I'm glad we've diagnosed that in each other. <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't it? I just read, so I just saw some meme that just all Pisces are pastel goths. Like that's what Pisces is. Isn't that right? Yeah, probably, probably. Yeah. <laughs> okay, should we end? Yeah, I wish we could have a Q&A now, but we can't. Yes, yeah, sorry, we can't have a Q&A. If anyone has like a burning question, um, You'll just have to keep it. <laughs> You'll just have to keep it to yourself. I don't know. Send it into the. You'll just have to send it into the void. Yeah. <laughs> um, I suppose we should say thank you to the ICA. Thank you to Sarah. Thank you very much to Sarah and the ICA for for hosting us. This was really lovely. 
Yeah, and how do how do um how do people pay, play Glut? They can go to glut.website and you can download the game for free. There's a Windows version and a Mac version. Um, if you, for access reasons, can't uh, play it, you can watch gameplay videos that are all on the page. There's ASL, BSL, and maybe not this month, but next month I'm going to make a director's commentary gameplay video, which I just think is going to be super fun. because <laughs> I've always wanted to be one of these like Twitch streamers. I see that for you. I see that for you. <laughs> Well, it's part of my other career, if this doesn't work out, to be to have an ASMR channel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, sign me up. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for doing yeah, this. Yeah, thank you. All right, bye. Bye. Okay.